You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> so continuing with our series on Asirat al-Nabawiyyah, the prophetic biography. In uh, the previous uh, session, last week's class, we talked about a very beautiful, interesting, well-known story from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ gave da'wah to um, a very... Uh, you know, famous, strong uh, person at that time from Quraysh. He was a famous wrestler, Rukana. And that story was represent- representative of the perseverance of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of giving the da'wah and sharing the message. So not only was it chronologically placed around that same time period that we're covering now, the po- post-boycott period, which is around the 10th year of Nubuwa prophethood, the Prophet ﷺ at this time is about 50 years old. But at the same time, it's also representative of the Prophet ﷺ's perseverance and the Prophet ﷺ's will and undefeatable um, himma that the Prophet ﷺ had in terms of doing the da'wah and how he continued to share the message. And he had not lost any of his vigor, none of his passion, none of his motivation. But he was just as inspired as he ever was um, in order to keep talking to and sharing the message message of Islam and telling people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this week's session, again, placed at that same time period, chronologically speaking, these next couple of incidents that we're going to talk about are based in that same time period, but what they are representative of is while the Prophet ﷺ hadn't lost any of his motivation, and he was going just as strong as ever in terms of sharing the message and talking to people and communicating with people, we see that the response from a lot of the leadership of Quraysh the majority of them who were opposed to the message of Islam and to the Prophet ﷺ, the strategy that they were also employing. So on one side we see the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ, now on this end of it we will see the strategy of the opposition to the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Ishaq relates in his, um, in his um, recollection of the seerah, he narrates that, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا جلس في المسجد فجلس إليه المصارعون من أصحابه خباب وعمار وأبو فكيها يسار وصهيب وأشباههم من المسلمين. That when the Prophet ﷺ would go to the Haram, he would regularly every day he would go to the Kaaba and he would pray there. And then of course he used to like spending some time there, you know, at the house of Allah at the Baytullah. When he would sit down there, many of the believers, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, would come and they would sit there with the Prophet sallallahu And they would gather around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be in his company, to learn from him, and to just, you know, benefit from the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi And it just so happened that many of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who would wait for the Prophet ﷺ to come to the Kaaba because the Prophet ﷺ still at this time to quite an extent was untouchable. They knew better than to lay hands on the Prophet ﷺ. Then they used to come at this time to come and sit around him and sit with him and this was their opportunity to be able to enjoy that, that, that time spent at the Kaaba without being harassed. And so the Sahaba like Khabbab, Ammar, Yasar, Suhaib, these Sahaba radiallahu anhum would come to the Prophet sallallahu at that time. And it just so happened that these are the Sahaba who were very weak. They were either slaves or they were freed slaves, former slaves. And many of these Sahaba had been the victims and the object of the torture and, and the persecution of the Quraysh and of the Meccans. So they used to come and sit around the Prophet ﷺ and would huddle up around him. At that time, Ibn Ishaq relates that, Haziat bihim Quraysh. That the Quraysh would then take that opportunity to make fun of them and mock them. 
وَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ هَؤُلَاءِ أَصْحَابُهُ كَمَا تَرَوْمُ That look at this, these are the companions of Muhammad. He wants us to come and join him. He wants us to sit with him and listen to him. These are his companions. These are his people. These are the people that sit around him. أَهَؤُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ That these people, what Muhammad is trying to say, that Allah has given preference to these people over us, that Allah has selected these people from amongst all of us with guidance and with the true religion of Islam, that these are the people that are blessed with the truth, these are the people that are guided by Allah, these are the people who are the recipients of the favor and the blessing of Allah that Muhammad, call, that Muhammad calls Islam. لَوْ كَانَ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ مُحَمَّدْ خَيْرًا مَا سَبَقَنَا هَاؤُلَاءِ إِلَيْهِ وَمَا خَصَّهُمُ اللَّهُ بِهِ دُونَنَا That if what Muhammad is delivering, if what Muhammad has to offer really is something so great and so amazing and so good and beneficial, then these people wouldn't have beaten us to it. And Allah wouldn't have selected these people over us with this religion and this realization and this belief in Iman. So there were two things here. Number one, you see the arrogance of the people. That many of these leaders of Quraysh, they were arrogant. And so there were pr two problems that they had. The first problem was that even if at this point in time, the truth of Islam was something that was making sense to them, Islam was making sense to them. Now the, the first problem for them was that, okay, this makes sense to me. I feel inclined towards at least listening to what he has to say, considering the message of Islam. But the problem is, if I go and accept Islam now, if I go and sit with Muhammad now, and somebody like Suhaib, or Ammar, or Khabbab, or, or somebody else of that stature, or that, uh, that, that position within the society, he beat me to it. He beat me to it. That Khabbab would have seniority over me. That Ammar would have, you know, rank over me. That I basically would publicly or personally to myself and then publicly to the rest of everyone else in Makkah be admitting that Khabbab figured this out before I could. That Bilal knew this before I did. That Suhaib is smarter than me. That I'd be publicly be admitting that. And I just can't do that. That was the ego that was getting in their way. Number two, the second problem was that just going and sitting with them in and of itself was part, part of the problem for them as well. That these people are slaves, or freed slaves, or immigrants, or poor people, or laborers, or, or workers, or whatever the case may be. I'm a leader. I'm the upper crust of Mecca. I'm an aristocrat. I can't go and sit with the riffraff. I can't sit with these types of people. It is not. It, it, it is beneath me to go and sit with such people. What is everybody else going to say? What is Abu Jahal going to say? What is Abu Lahab going to say? And and then there there was that fear of being outcast by everybody else in Mecca, by the rest of the leadership of Mecca. Then I won't get invited to that party, and I won't be welcome in that circle. And then he won't want to do business with me. So these were the two problems that these people had. Number one was just sitting with these people in general, because they, they thought them to be below them, beneath them, and therefore being in their company was unacceptable to them. And secondly, was that, okay, this message makes sense to me, this is the truth. Then they, would, then they, they felt like they'd be in a position to have to force, to, to have to admit, they'd be forced to admit that somebody like Suhay, Bilal, Khabab, Ammar, who again, unfortunately, they consider to be beneath them and below them, that those people um, were more intelligent than they were and figured this out before they could. And so that was, presenting these pe that was preventing these people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the ayat in the Qur'an. So of course, this chatter is going on. Going on. This is the tone of the dialogue amongst a lot of people in Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Prophet ﷺ, without a doubt, heard about this. The Muslims of that time heard about it. The same Bilal, Khabbab, Suhaib, Ammar were hearing about this. 
The Prophet ﷺ was hearing about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down some ayat from the Qur'an. To bring, because you can imagine how hurtful it must have been for them to hear this, the Sahaba. That number one, that they were looked down upon by these people in such a manner. They were reviled by these people. Number two, there was also maybe, maybe there could have been some level of guilt that am I the reason why somebody wouldn't accept the message of Islam? Am I holding some people back? Maybe I shouldn't come sit with the Prophet ﷺ anymore. Maybe I just shouldn't show my face in public. Maybe I shouldn't be around the Prophet ﷺ. I'm a deterrent from accepting the message. So this was very hurtful, undermining their confidence as believers, as human beings. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ hears about this. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ was above and beyond such thoughts. إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقِنَا عَظِيمٌ Allah attests to the level of the Prophet ﷺ's character. He would never think that about anyone. But nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ is hearing people talk, talking like this in this manner. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the ayat of the Qur'an. وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَلَاةِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعَ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُوطًا In another place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لِيَقُولُوا أَهَاؤُلَا إِمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ عَمِلَ مِنْكُمْ سُوءًا بِجَهَالَةٍ ثُمَّ تَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَصْلَحَ فَإِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu this from Surah Al-An'am that وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا That do not ever cast aside, do not ever leave out, do not ever outcast, don't ever overlook, don't you dare ever leave aside, overlook. Those people, يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ who call out to their Lord and their Master in the morning and in the evening. They pray to Allah, morning and evening. يُرِيدُونَ وَجَهُ All they want in this life, in this world, is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They seek nothing but the pleasure of Allah. مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ That you are not answerable or accountable on their behalf. وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Nor will they have to answer on your behalf. فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ and that, that you would, cap, meaning Allah will take care of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of you. Allah protects you. And you are accountable and answerable before Allah. Similarly, Allah takes care of them, looks after them, and they all have to answer to Allah. فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ So don't ever cast them aside or leave them aside. فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Because if you were to leave them aside or overlook them or outcast them, or, or just tell them to leave, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ You would become one of the wrongdoing and one of the oppressors, along with the rest of the oppressors. وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ In another place, the other ayah that I recited from the other place, Allah said, بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ Don't ever overlook them. Don't I ever overlook them. So Allah already said that don't cast them aside. But then Allah is also saying don't underestimate them. وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Because if you were to overlook them and their value and their significance and what they bring to the table and what they're capable of and the khair that Allah has placed in them, تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That would be an indication of the fact that you are more motivated by the glitz and the glamour of this world than you are the pleasure of Allah. تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعَ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَا وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُوطًا And do not ever follow, do not ever listen, do not ever fall, um, do not ever listen or give in to, or fall victim to the rhetoric 
the, 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 the propaganda of someone whose heart Allah says, we have made devoid from Allah's remembrance. Allah said, we have not given these people, like the people like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, we have not given them the ability to remember us. There is no dhikr and remembrance of Allah in their heart. There is no nur of iman in their hearts. Those people do nothing but follow their own desires, and everything that those people do is in vain. All of their efforts are in vain. No fruits will come about from what these people are doing or what they're saying. So don't listen to those people. Don't be influenced. Don't fall under the influence of those people. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that don't cast them aside because then you would be wrongdoing. You'd be just as oppressive as those people who are creating this propaganda against these faithful, believing people. These are believers. Mu'minun Allah. They are, they are firm believers in the sight, in the eyes of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ This is a test Allah said that we have created amongst people. Some of them are a test for others amongst them. لِيَقُولُوا That's why they say, أَهَاؤُلَا إِمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا That these people? Really God has blessed these people from amongst us? Really? These people? أَهَاؤُلَا إِمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Allah says, doesn't Allah know best about those people who are truly, consistently grateful to Allah? Allah knows those people best. And here subtly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has embedded something. A profound lesson and a reminder. We see this clash in society. Where you have people who believe and people who don't believe. People who accept the message, people who are refuting and denying the message. And we see the circumstances that the people who accept the message, believe in the message, keep company with the Prophet وسلم, the devout, the faithful, the observant, the believing, that they happen to be from a social perspective, based on the um, unfortunate social circumstances and standards at that time, they happen to be people of the lower caste in society. And we see that the people who are opposing the message, opposing the message, the people who do not believe, the people who do not accept, the people who are not faithful, not believing, not, fa- not, not, not observant, that those people happen to be, again, based on the unfortunate social standards at that time, they, they are the upper crust of that society. And these are the circumstances. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a lesson here. أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Then what's the secret here? What's the secret? Because like we understand, based on the scenario at that time, Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, Umayyah bin Khalaf, Walid bin Mughira. So we see that social standard, wealth, fame, power, popularity, seniority, know-how and knowledge of the world, education, that these are not prerequisites to iman, that these are not the conditions for acceptance by Allah. But does this necessitate? Because this idea has prevailed. This idea has taken many, many throughout Islamic history, in certain movements or certain segments of Muslim society at different points in Islamic history, some people have latched on to the idea that in fact, if you survey the Sahaba in Mecca, then you see, like I said, the Abu Jahls and Abu Lahabs of that society do not believe. But on the other hand, Khabbab, Bilal, Suhaib, Ammar are the faithful, are the believing. So does this mean that while fame, money, popularity, and power, education, does not result in faith, is faith, does it gravitate towards? Or do people who are downtrodden, people who are poor, people who are oppressed, people who are disenfranchised, do they naturally gravitate towards faith? That's a valid question. That if on one end, if money, power, fame, does not equal faith, then does poverty, oppression, Victimization, does this result in faith? Is, uh, is, is faith a natural consequence of these conditions? 
That's a very valid question. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course we know that Khadija, Abu Bakr, Uthman ibn Affan, Abdurrahman bin Auf, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with them, establish and prove the fact that that's not the case. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly and very explicitly in the ayah says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Neither one of these things necessitate faith. That yes, a person's faith can be influenced by their circumstances without a doubt, but it does not necessitate faith. Faith is not just inherently more available or afforded to people of power or money or influence. Similarly, it is not more natural or more automatically afforded, or people who are disenfranchised and poor and, and impoverished, again, are not entitled to faith. There's no entitlement. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِعَلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ It is gratitude that Allah looks for. It is gratitude that Allah rewards with faith. The grateful are rewarded with faith. This is something I, I oftentimes emphasize, that... When we talk about even the conversation of Iman, when we talk about teaching people Iman, when we talk about inspiring Iman within people, da'wah work, that one of the very fundamental lessons in that regard is we need to instill uh, an, an attitude of gratitude. We need to have a conversation that inspires people, that reminds people of how blessed they are. Our primary responsibility is to inspire hope within people and that is first and foremost done by reminding people of how blessed they are and how much they have to be grateful for. Gratitude leads to iman. Gratitude even amongst the Muslim community. Create, it, remind people of how blessed they are. Inspire gratitude within people. Because gratitude leads to obedience. Gratitude leads to iman. That is very very important to remember. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here. So that's why we see the diversity in the generation of Sahaba. But the consistent thread, the link between all of them, the consistent thing amongst all of them, was a sense of gratitude. أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Allah did not just simply say, بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِالْمُسْلِمِينَ بِالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ He didn't say the believers, He didn't say the Muslims, those who submit, He didn't say the weak. The downtrodden, the oppressed, the disenfranchised. He said, Bishakirin. Allah knows best those people who are grateful. So the, 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 the poverty of these people and the wealth and the power of these people, all of that is essentially irrelevant. The only thing that is relevant in the eyes of Allah is gratitude. Gratefulness and gratitude. That is the gateway, that is the key to unlocking, the do- to unlocking and opening the door of the heart and allowing iman to enter into the heart, is gratitude. And once that iman enters into the heart, then whatever the external circumstances of a person are, whether again they be poverty or they be power and money, all of that is then submitted to Allah. Then a person will implement the obedience of Allah in their poverty in their being oppressed. And on the, on the other hand, a person will invest their, their influence and their power and their wealth, again, into the obedience of Allah. Which is exactly what we saw from both ends of the spectrum in the generation of Sahaba. And so that's where Allah creates some focus. أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Then Allah goes on to say, this is ayah number 52 and 53, and then ayah number 54 of Surah Al-An'am. Allah says, وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا Then when those people who do firmly believe in our signs, our miraculous signs, our ayat, our verses, when they do come to you, فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Something very beautiful. Because the specific circumstances that we're dealing with is that the majority of those people that are believing and especially keeping close company with the Prophet ﷺ happen to be the poor, the, 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 the downtrodden, the disenfranchised. And they are being ridiculed and mocked. And not only that, but the rhetoric now is we specifically cannot believe, we cannot sit with Muhammad ﷺ because of the riffraff. Because of the trash and the garbage that sits around him, 
And like I said, one of the implications of this was, imagine the effect that that had on Bilal and Suhaib and Ammar and Khabbab. Imagine the impact that that had on them. Imagine how difficult that would be to listen to, to hear. You see Muhammad Rasulullah you believe in Allah, you believe in the Qur'an, you believe in his prophethood. You've benefited so much, you love him so much. You want this truth and this message to be shared with all of humanity. And to even hear these rumors, and for a second that thought to cross your mind, that am I a deterrent? That me sitting here, bruised, bruised and beaten, filthy and dirty, clothes torn and tattered, because I am what I am? That am I a reason why somebody else isn't coming here and hearing this? Iman, Hidayah, Guidance? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only is saying directly revealing in the Qur'an that no, no, Allah never once described them as al-musala'afeen. Allah described them as what? إِذَا رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ وَلَا تَطْرُودِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا Allah described them as devout. Allah described them as faithful, sincere people. And Allah attributed whatever thoughts or concerns those people had as their problem. فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ That's their problem. That is their fitna. That has nothing to do with these people. And then on top of that, He's telling the Prophet ﷺ, and it is your job to further reinforce them. To dispel any of these ideas. وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا Allah said without any bias, any consideration for their external circumstances. If they are faithful and they believe in Allah, and they come and they sit with you, فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ You welcome them. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ This is two things. Number one, of course, it's a dua for them. You encourage them. You motivate them. You inspire them. You reinforce them. You make dua for them. May peace and blessings be upon you. And secondly, of course, it can literally mean the salam. You greet them. You welcome them. Yeah, you greet them and you welcome them. Just get the mental image in your head. Get the mental Im image in your head. Try to put yourself in those circumstances. That you might, mashallah, be somebody who's very educated, very respectful, very respected. You live in a nice house, you drive a nice car, you wear nice clothes, you have a nice job, you're very well known, you're very popular. Everybody loves you, everybody looks forward to seeing you, everybody gets a smile on their face when they see you, everybody lines up to shake your hand and say salam. And you're walking into the masjid. And at the same time you're walking into the masjid, there's another man walking in. And his hair is disheveled. He looks all unkept. He hasn't had a haircut in a long time. He hasn't been trimmed up and groomed and cleaned up in a long time. Clothes are torn and tattered. You know what a homeless person looks like? Where they're wearing most of their clothing? We don't, we don't, we don't realize that, do we? When you see homeless people a lot of times, they'll be wearing a lot of their clothing. They don't have anywhere to put it. When they move, when they leave, wherever they're sleeping there for that night, when they go somewhere during the daytime, they have to take everything that belongs to them with them. So that person's wearing like two, three like sweaters and coat and jacket. And it's all torn and tattered and dirty. Maybe that person doesn't smell really great. They're carrying like a trash bag with clothes in it. And they're walking into the masjid with you at the same time. What's the thought that goes through our head when we see that person walking in? What, what, what do we think when we see that person walking in? What's the thought that crosses our mind? What thought enters into our heart? May Allah forgive us. That was... The Khabbab, that was the Suhaib, that was Ammar. And when we walk into the masjid, that person walks in with us, and we're a little apprehensive, kind of nervous. Is this, what's this person coming here to do? Why is this person here? 
It becomes the job of the leadership of the community at that time. It's the job of the leadership of the community at that time. So when you walk in and the imam of the masjid, the president of the masjid, the board member of the masjid, the administrator of the masjid, the sheikh in the masjid, when he walks, he's standing there in the lobby, saying salam to everybody, all the regulars. And he sees that person walks in, and he goes, salam alaikum, how's it going brother? And he goes and he hugs him and he shakes his hand, how's it going, everything's good, everything's alright? Great to see you here again. It provides a little perspective, doesn't it? May Allah forgive us because of our own shortcomings, our own lack of iman, our own biases and prejudices. We might have been having a couple of thoughts about that person. But when the imam or the leader of the community steps up and hugs that person, welcomes that person, brother, how's it going? Maybe even knows their name. Brother Ahmed, good to see you again. Jazakallah khair. Good to see you, mashallah. Keep coming back. We miss you around here. Puts you right back in your place. You realize. That's, that's responsibility of leadership. Leadership isn't just wearing this mic. It's not just getting to, you know, stand on stage or take credit or have your name on a piece of paper. But that's leadership. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet ﷺ, it is your job. It is your job to establish the equilibrium in community, in society. فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ Allah is commanding the Prophet سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ You welcome them, you get up and you shake their hand and you hug them. Khabbab, how's it going? Missed you last night. Where you been? So hey, hey, come on, salamu alaykum. Hey, I'm looking for you. Sit over here, I saved you a seat. Ammar, I saved you a seat, come here. When the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina, and he arrived in Quba, and he saw Ammar radiallahu anhu, who had to run away from Mecca, run off to Abyssinia, then left Abyssinia and went to Medina. He didn't have a home, he didn't have family, he didn't have anything. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Quba, imagine the impact it must have had. All of the residents of Quba and Medina must have known. They were believers, so of course, you know, they were, these are Sahaba. So of course they were hospitable and welcoming, and they didn't judge. But still imagine Ammar and who Ammar is. He's homeless, he's sleeping in the masjid. He's waiting for somebody to just invite him to their home at night and share some food with him, otherwise he doesn't have any food. He's wearing all the clothes that he owns. He's got a little sack that is his soul, all of his belongings in this world. And when the Prophet ﷺ arrives in Quba and everybody's out there welcoming, ready to open up their homes, ready to shower the Prophet ﷺ with gifts, it said when the families went out there, everybody was holding a gift for the Prophet ﷺ. He's the VIP of all VIPs. He is the ultimate guest of honor. And at that point in time, when everybody's there showering their affections and admiration for the Prophet ﷺ, Imagine the scene. Just try to imagine how powerful the impact must have been. Everybody, hundreds of faithful, are standing there welcoming Muhammad Rasulullah. Little kids are literally singing, welcoming the Prophet. Women have food ready and cooked. People and children are standing there presenting gifts and flowers to the Prophet. And at that point in time, the Prophet sees Ammar standing there. His face lit up to see the Prophet ﷺ again. The only thought that's kept him going this entire time. He's homeless, he's a vagabond, he's a, he's, a, he's a drifter at this point. He doesn't have a home, he doesn't have family. The only thought that's keeping him going so far is to be able to see the face of the Prophet ﷺ again. And when the Prophet ﷺ sees Ammar, imagine the impact and the tone it set for the whole community that when the Prophet ﷺ sees Ammar, he says, Marhaban bi tayyib al mutayyib. He says, Welcome, welcome, look at it, the most beautiful man I've ever seen in my entire life. Now that's a sight for sore eyes. That's the most beautiful face I've ever seen. Where you been? I missed you. I missed that beautiful face. Come here, come give me a hug. Come give me a hug. Called him out from the crowd and hugged him in front of everyone. Imagine the impact it had. And the narration even says that when the Prophet ﷺ sat down at Quba, because everybody welcomed him, came and surrounded him with food, you can imagine. 
They put out the, the best dates, the juiciest dates that they had. He told Amma, Suhaib, Suhaib, who was one of these again, he had to literally give up everything that he had in order to be able to leave Makkah. When he was trying to leave Makkah and make hijrah to Medina, they, they came and they basically blocked him off and they said, ah, 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 we ain't gonna let you leave like that. He said, listen, he said, we could fight this out and I'm good. I'll take a few of y'all out before you get a shot at me. Or, I have, I, I, you know, I, I, I've been working hard in Mecca for all these years. I got some property and some money and some stuff back in Mecca stashed away. You want it? You can go back and I'll tell you exactly where it is. You go back, you make a little cash today, and you just pretend like you never saw me leave. They're like, sounds like a deal. So they left. And Suhaib went on. No home, no money, no nothing left. And when he met the Prophet ﷺ, when, he met the, when the Prophet ﷺ arrived at Quba and he met Suhaib, the Prophet ﷺ not only you know, read him the ayah, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ Some people, they will literally sell everything that they have in order to seek the pleasure of Allah. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised the transaction you did, Suhaib. You gave up everything you had in order to believe. Then the Prophet ﷺ, again, this is a homeless man. He's got nothing. Everything that he's wearing is all that he owns. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, come eat with me. Imagine all of Medina, all the faithful, hundreds are there, sitting in, around the Prophet ﷺ, putting their food in front of him. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Suhaib, Suhaib, where's Suhaib? He's sitting in the back. Homeless guy. Poor man. He says, come here, come here, come here. I saved you a seat. You eaten anything yet? I know you haven't. Come here. Calls him up and sits him down with him. And talks with him. And shares food with him. And jokes with him. And then Suhaib begins to pick up the dates and eat the dates. There must have been other food there, but he specifically goes for the dates. And he had a sore eye. And one of the remedies at that time was that if you kind of had like a sore eye, you had an infection in your eye, they used to tell you not to eat dates. That wasn't good for the infection in your eye. So the Prophet said, hey, I mean, look at the attention to detail. He's like, he, he knows him, he loves him, and he makes that apparent to everyone. He goes, whoa, whoa, easy there. You got that infection in your eye, I see that. You're going to eat those dates? So Haib says, no, no, don't worry, Prophet. He says, oh, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry. I'm eating it with the other eye. I'll eat it from this side. I won't eat it from that side. I'll eat it from this side. We're good. Don't worry about it. Uh, let a brother get his grub on now. Right? I mean, just look at the relationship. And so this was the Prophet So Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ, فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ You say salam to them. You welcome them. You embrace them. You hug them. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ And then you congratulate them. You let them know not only you love them, but Allah loves them. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Your Lord has made mercy... He, your Lord has written mercy upon كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ upon Himself. Which is like an Arabic expression for saying that your Lord has decreed that He will be merciful to you. Your Lord will deal with you in a merciful way. كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ your Lord has obligated mercy upon Himself. It's like an Arabic expression for saying, your Lord will deal with you in a merciful manner. Your Lord's policy is mercy. Allah's policy with you is mercy. أَنَّهُ مَنْ عَمِلَ مِنْكُمْ سُوءًا بِجَهَالَةٍ And don't worry, if you ever do mess up, your Lord has also His policy is what? That if any one of you ends up doing something bad, بِجَهَالَةٍ Out of ignorance, like unknowingly, without knowing, one of you may be messed up or did something wrong. ثُمَّ تَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ But then he repents back to Allah, turns back to Allah, وَأَصْلَحَ and corrects his course of action. فَأَنَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Then he most, he most definitely without a doubt is extremely forgiving and extremely merciful. Constantly forgiving and constantly merciful. This was the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet ﷺ on how to establish the community. So I told you that the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ was to give da'wah and to have no quit in him. But I also told you that on the other hand, this was one of the strategies of some of the leaders of Quraysh. To mock, to ridicule, to point out who was around him, who was following him. We can't sit with people like that. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ, don't ever listen to what these people have to say. These people are far more valuable than they will ever understand. These are people who are beloved to Allah. These are people who are beloved to Allah. Not, and, and these people, their value and their significance will become apparent, not only in the hereafter, but even in this world. What happened later on? When the community was established in Medina, and somebody needed to call out the adhan, and stand at a, at a higher level and call everyone to, the, to, the, to, to salah, somebody who was granted that honor of calling the adhan, who was it? It was Bilal, that same freed slave. They said, I can't go and sit with him. It was Bilal now giving the adhan, calling them to salah. It was Abdullah bin Umi Maktoum, the blind man, the poor blind man, who nobody wanted to sit around with. It was them. It was them. Who, Ammar radiallahu anhu was one of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba. He was a great teacher of the, of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un. It was those same people. So we see that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu on how to handle this situation. And we specifically see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guiding and teaching the Prophet sallallahu leadership qualities and how to build a community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to only seek the pleasure of Allah and to never ever judge anyone by their, by their, by, by their exterior or by what we see or their conditions or their situations. But understand, we never know who is truly beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Value every person, respect every person, and we only strive to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be more like Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasaghfirka wa natubu ilayk.